Writing code can feel so innocent, so distant from the woes of the security team. A simple API that serves images, for example, will allow the client to call our API with the query parameter specifying the image they want returned, because why not? Within our application's root directory, we have an image folder that potentially contains the very image that said client is looking for. So internally, we'll build the path to the requested image file. Then we'll extract the image data and return it to the client. But who is the client? Some asshole that wants to exploit our innocent code? Someone who understands that maybe, just maybe, our code is naive enough to allow the client to traverse the directories of our server. Maybe they stumble into our server's root directory and from there into Etsy. Maybe our server is compromised. And directory traversal is just one common code vulnerability. And understanding this one exploit isn't sufficient enough to shift the way you think. So keep watching. A standard login page. It's quite simple, really. If we don't have an account, we don't have access, right? Well, it depends. A bad actor could attempt to brute force their way in using the largest password dump in history. But where's the fun in that? What if instead of exploiting the user's inability to come up with a secure password, they opt to exploit the engineer's inability to write secure code? A little SQL knowledge is all we need, and we're in. A very peculiar password indeed. These credentials are sent to the login endpoint of the backend server, where the query is created that will be used to get the user from the database. When this password is concatenated with the query string, you'll notice that the trailing single quote for the password that's in the original query is made obsolete by the hash symbol, which turns everything after it into a comment. That's because this password provides its own single quote to close off the password. And it does that so that it can add an additional part to the query, that being or1 equals 1. So this query reads as if the password and email here match or 1 equals 1. Well, 1 is always equal to 1. This query is then sent to the internal database to query the user's table. And what's returned from the DB as a result of this query might surprise you. That's right, every single user. Like I said, one is always equal to one. Now you should be starting to notice a common theme here. That being that all of these exploits are made possible because the code examples are naive enough to trust user input. In this case, for example, when a message is sent to the chat, internally that message is being directly inserted into the database.
Then in order to display that message back to the end users, the message is loaded from the database and embedded into the HTML that will be used to display the message on the front end. Now, each time you visit a website, your browser downloads HTML, CSS, and JavaScript from the server that hosts the website. And in this case, that HTML includes the generated HTML for the message and the embedded message. This means that the browser is assuming that any embedded malicious scripts can be trusted since it comes from the same origin, that of the application itself. So basically, this exploit breaks the same origin policy by tricking the browser into thinking that the malicious script is originating from the server, because technically it is. And what this means is the malicious script can access secrets such as cookies associated with the website, because after all, we're all friends here, right? Anyways, there you have it, some common code vulnerabilities to look out for. Although this isn't an exhaustive list of code vulnerabilities, it should put you in the right mindset to write more secure code, as it gives you a general understanding of some of the most common ways that your code can be used against you. So if you found this video helpful, don't forget to like and or subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.